This is an overview of the New England Renewable Energy Zone. The New England Res is designed to deliver 8 gigawatts of deliverable energy. This could be expected to be made up of 2300 wind towers and around 19 million solar panels. This was all designed without any community consultation. Energy Co have simply dictated the project to the community, not designed it with the community in mind. The New England is not a special renewable resource area. It was chosen using desktop mapping along with ambitious and exaggerated developer lobbying with little or no strategic planning. Much of that developer interest has now evaporated due to landholder refusal or the economic reality of developing with mountainous areas and difficult terrain. This development on densely settled agricultural land amongst high value ecological landscape is not suitable for these areas. The New England Res has unique concerns relating to areas of high biodiversity along the Great Dividing Range. Areas of eucalypt timber have already been challenged by old practices of clearing, bushfire and cycles of drought. What has been retained are the important ridgetop corridors of remnant vegetation extending from the gorges and national parks. Unfortunately, this is the target area for clearing to make way for project infrastructure. Without these connecting corridors of remnant vegetation, wildlife cannot survive. Massive solar projects are set out over B-cell areas or biophysical strategic agricultural land. This is a classification that applies to high value food bowls. Solar placements are taking production away from prime agricultural areas. In the event of fire, hailstorm or other damage, these toxic panels would leach and leave this country poisoned, unable to produce food and fibre again. The Salisbury Plains consists of black basalt soils, a highly valuable farming and livestock production area, the floodplains and catchment of the Maclay River system. The wedgetail eagle and other protected and endangered raptors use the updrafts from the gorge to soar above the edge of the National Park. This is right in the path of the proposed Winterbourne Wind Project and they face decimation if these towers are built. So one of the big issues now for woodland birds particularly is loss of habitat and loss of connectivity. We've got about 20 or so species across the tablelands that are threatened at one level or other and including a couple that are critically endangered which is swift parrot and regent honeyeater. A number of others that are also federally listed at, at vulnerable or endangered level as well as you know, quite a lot of state listed vulnerable species. And then we've got the wetlands. Um, we've got a number of lagoons across the tablelands that support both resident and migratory um, uh, wetland birds, uh, some, of which, uh, some of which are threatened. A lot, a lot of the migratory ones now are listed as threatened and you know they're migrating from the Arctic Circle to spend our summer down here before they go back again to um, breed in the Northern Hemisphere and their issues include the fact that some of them travel at night and move between wetlands on the tablelands um, and be, they could be at risk of collisions with various things like power lines as well as fences and, and also of course turbines and then we've got the birds of prey that we've got we've got about 18 species of, of raptor on across the tablelands of which several are threatened um, and I'm working particularly on three threatened raptors um, and it's the big ones that are less agile that are more likely to come to grief um, in collisions with turbines. There's also the issue of, of collision with power lines and also even um, electrocution on, on power poles. But yeah, there's quite a, a strike rate on wedge-tailed eagles. Um, and of course, that's only the ones that are found, you know, beneath the turbines as well. So it's quite likely this, the, the strike rate is higher because the birds that um, get injured and die off site are not being found. And, and of course the gorge rims uh, attract a lot of soaring birds of prey because of the updrafts and so on. The topography um, makes it a bit of a hot spot for, for things like eagles. Um, oh, and that, that raises the issue of, of putting renewables, I suppose, too close to high conservation value areas like national parks as well. I mean, there'd, there'd be a risk if it's too close to um, conservation areas that, that um, they would be compromising the, the biodiversity values of those reserves. So that's another another issue with the sustainability aspect, I guess, yeah. Um, so yeah, there needs, seems to be some need, or a need for some way to get around this sort of conflict between renewables and, and biodiversity because if it doesn't seem to me ecologically sustainable to be having an impact on, 
on biodiversity when you're trying to combat climate change as well. So we've got to know how to deal with both. Um, there's an extinction crisis already as, as, as well as a climate crisis. Rejoining the overview, we travel north to the now abandoned Doughboy project, an example of a developer being confronted with a reality of difficult terrain, as well as landholders on high value agricultural country rejecting the project on the basis of multiple neighbours being affected. Areas of koala habitat are prevalent in the Great Dividing Ranges, as are areas of other habitat for threatened species of both flora and fauna. Glossy black cockatoo, greater glider, brush tail rock wallaby, species of bats and many others are all impacted by the development in this fragile area. For each project, hundreds of hectares of trees, many being hundred year old hollow bearing trees and various threatened species are destined to be cleared to make way for access roads, lay down areas, foundation areas for turbines and power lines. The Buralong and Warani wind projects are noted as important koala habitat. Koalas are now listed as endangered. The koala that we have grown to love is in a terrible position and not enough people are standing up to ensure that humans don't wipe them from this planet. An entire species being completely eradicated due to human error is a terrifying thought. Koalas move through areas from tree to tree. They mostly do this by climbing down one tree, walking or cantering a very short distance and climbing straight up the next tree. When koalas have excellent habitat to do this, they can move through areas safely because of how the corridor of trees has grown. When you begin to take trees out of that corridor, wildlife begins to suffer enormously. The more trees you take, the more koalas die because they have to travel huge distances to not only get to the next random tree, but to get to the next tree that is healthy, has moisture and is suitable for that koala at that time of the season. Certain corridors have been identified as critical koala habitat, which is essentially a koala corridor that is used by many koalas extremely frequently and at all times of the year. Many of those identified areas run through various areas throughout the New England. Most notably and closest to Armadale is the Borlong area. The Borlong area, like much of the New England, has wind farms proposed for that exact land. If those projects go ahead, it will mean the end of koalas in the New England. It is not an exaggeration to say that all of their habitat will be gone and all of the koalas will be dead. Koalas have to be able to move through huge areas of connected corridors for survival. It's a death wish for them to be on the ground for very long, for many reasons. If these renewable projects get approval in the New England, there will not be any connected corridors. Koalas will be stranded. The koalas who aren't physically killed by the renewable energy workers will die soon after as a direct result of habitat loss. Koalas already have it tough enough with poor amounts of tree planting, private trees being cut down, dog attacks, vehicle strikes, chlamydia, natural deaths and more. They simply cannot handle this extreme attempt to cull them all together. This doesn't just apply to koalas, it applies to many species, many of whom are listed as critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. The New England has uniquely high agricultural production levels and high land values with smaller holdings relative to other res zones. These projects have a larger number of impacted neighbours, a result of poor planning. Of note, Buralong Wind Project against Armidale has 60 homes within 4 kilometres of turbines. Access is a major issue for the New England res. Many of the New England towns are accessed by a limited network of single lane mountainous roads. These roads leave no space for passing of slow travelling, oversized and overmassed trucks, leaving businesses and residents without safe or effective access. This impacts time-critical livestock delivery, transport industries, tourism commerce, courier businesses, medical services, school bus traffic and general transport, all leading to frustrated drivers and increasing the likelihood of accidents and fatalities. With a heavy reliance on aircraft for agriculture, aerial firefighting, medical care and retrieval, the New England Res is also impacted by characteristic low cloud and fog on the top of the dividing range as it rolls up from the east to the higher altitudes. The eastern side of the res is at threat of losing these critical services if wind towers are built. Commercial operators have described these potential wind project areas as no-fly zones if there is a presence of fog, cloud or smoke from fires. As many of these areas are against National Park, the risk of fires is high and we lose our critical life-saving firefighting tool, aerial water bombing. It is increasingly obvious that large-scale projects in the New England Res are becoming less and less bankable. Site access, steep terrain, 
high value biodiversity and high value ag production are all challenges the New England Res faces. If this was open country, accessible by major highway, in low production areas, it would be a different story. There is community resistance in the New England Res for good reasons. Without considerable and ongoing subsidy, these projects are not viable in comparison to projects west of the Newell Highway. The New England Res is a broken design. Using outdated information, it is poorly located and poorly planned. We need a reset.